My name is Wayne Xiong. I'm a co-founder of the Grassroots Animal Rights Network, Direct Action Everywhere. And I went vegan, I guess there are two possible dates I could give. One is the year that I tried to go vegan, <laughs> which is 1999. And, and that was a year when I went vegan, primarily because there was a girl in a group that I was a part of who was vegan and I wanted to impress her. I was already an animal lover and an animal rights person, but it took that little push to convince me that I should at least try. And I failed, she didn't like me, and I also didn't fully go vegan. But the year I actually really went vegan was 2001. And the reason I went vegan was because my dog died. And I felt terribly guilty about a lot of things that had happened with her when she was growing up, because our family didn't really treat her the way she should have been treated. Um, she lived in the laundry room for the first couple years of her life. We didn't have any experience raising animals, and so my parents thought it was appropriate to hit a dog, so that's the way we disciplined her, and it was not cool. And we stopped eventually when we figured out that, you know, this is a member of our family. This is not just some sort of toy. Um, but the main reason I felt horribly guilty was when she was ill near the end of her life, I chose to stay in Chicago and study for the GRE, which test you have to take before you're applying for graduate school. And I thought that was more important than going back to see my little sister. And she ended up dying before I could see her again. So I said after she died, you know, I have to do something really important for her. And at the time in 2001, I was, let's officially and finally really go vegan. And I did. Hey, I bet that girl's impressed by you now if you met her again. Maybe, I doubt it. <laughs> Impressed by all my felonies. No, I, you know, I don't even remember her name, honestly. Yeah. But I was such a shy. I never even really talked to her, to be honest. So it was, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it might have even worked if I had, well, one, if I had actually gone vegan. I was already vegetarian at the time. So in 1999, I was already vegetarian. But I wasn't vegan yet. I, I was very impressed by her. I thought, wow, this, how do you go vegan? I don't even understand how you do this. Because you can't eat cookies. You know, that was the crazy thing for me. How are you going to eat cookies if you're not, if you're not going to eat dairy? And... I don't think there's anywhere in Chicago I was aware of where there were vegan cookies, so I had to learn to bake my own. And that turned into a whole story in and of itself, because I ended up baking, I don't know how many cookies I've baked in over my life, but it's at least in the thousands, it might be in the tens of thousands of vegan cookies I've cooked, baked, not cooked, over the last 20 years of life, my life, and primarily in my first five years of veganism, because I use them in outreach almost every day, so. Yeah, I went vegetarian about a year before that, and I was vegetarian for animal rights reasons. I think I read Animal Liberation when I was 15 years old, somewhere around then, before I went to college. So it was probably roughly 1996. Uh, I think I just saw it in a library, and I was a very curious kid, and I always loved animals. Animals were everything to me, because um, I didn't have many friends when I was growing up. I mean, when you're a fat immigrant kid growing up in central Indiana, you're not gonna have any friends. And my dog was my best friend once we adopted her when I was, I think, seven, eight years old. But even before I had a dog, all the other animals in our community, and we lived in you know, a, a place where there was a forest around us. There was a creek, there were lots of animals running around. And I just loved every animal. I mean, the animals were my friends. I'd get zoo books, these monthly magazines about some species of animal. and. Obviously now I know zoos are terrible places, but zoo books were actually amazing. And I, I remember every, I think, I don't remember what day of the month it was, but when the zoo book was gonna arrive, I was just always so excited. I can't tell my mom and dad, mom, is a zoo book gonna arrive soon? I'm so excited, I'm gonna learn about these new animals. And I would talk to all the animals in my neighborhood. We were pretty poor when I was growing up, so going to the zoo was hard and expensive, but there's like one day out of the month where I don't remember if it was a free day or just heavily discounted trips to the zoo, and that was always my favorite day of the month. So, well, my favorite days of the month were when I was gonna get the zoo book in the mail and when I could go to the zoo. Cause, but even then, I mean, I remember fairly early on, probably when I was like five, maybe even earlier than that, when I went to the Indianapolis Zoo, I remember thinking there was something weird about captivity because I had this really powerful experience where, you know, there are these primates, and. Back in those days in the Ample Zoo, they didn't really secure the exhibits that well from the human beings. So you could do like weird shit to kind of get fairly close to the animals. And 
Like, I loved monkeys. I mean, I loved animals. The monkeys were just amazing and hilarious because they're so similar to human beings. And when I was a kid, there was a way for you to, like, sneak under a fence and go under another fence. This is, like, early open rescue work when I was five years old. <laughs> wasn't planning to rescue the monkeys. I just wanted to get closer to them. But the cage the monkeys were in, this exhibit, was there were holes in the cage, in, like, the cage wire that would allow the monkeys, the baby monkeys at least, to put their arms through the cage and reach out towards you. And if you climbed under like two little fences, you could kind of reach out and get close to them. Still not close enough you could actually touch their hand. That's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to like grab a hold of a monkey's hand and shake their hand because they're very similar to me and they look, they look similar to you and they're, they're similarly curious. They want to play. And I remember like grabbing lots of sticks at the zoo and like I would literally hand sticks to the monkeys, the, the baby monkeys, and they'd grab them, be super excited and run off their sticks. And that made me so happy that I could hand sticks to the monkeys. But... I remember at the time, like, I'd, I'd see these little kid monkeys, and I was a little kid, and I'd ask my parents, you know, wait, they're little kids just like me. They want to play with the stick. They want to have fun with me. I mean, we're having this really touching moment where I'm handing this monkey a stick, and they're having the time of their life. And I asked my mom and dad, like, wait, why are on the other side of that cage? Like, if they're kids just like me, why can't they be free? I mean, I'm, I get to go home, and they're here, and they're still stuck in this cage. And why is that? And my parents didn't really have a good explanation for it. It was the first time I thought hard about captivity. I had no political conscience, and I, you know, like a lot of kids, I just said, oh, I guess it's just the way it is. You know, they're a monkey, I'm a human being, so I get to be free and they're stuck in a cage. But it did seem to me like I was a little sad. I, I, wanted, I wanted them to come home with me, or at least to be able to play with me and, and not be stuck behind the cage, and not for me to have to sneak underneath two fences to be able to hand them sticks. But I probably handed like hundreds of sticks to the monkeys, and I bet... Whoever the zookeeper was at the Indianapolis Zoo was wondering, where are these monkeys getting all these sticks? Like every day during the free day, for some reason, there's like 30 sticks these baby monkeys are getting. And I don't know where they're getting them because they're not in the exhibit, but they keep collecting all these sticks. So I don't know. But so I was already predisposed towards being a vegetarian, but reading Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, you know, it shook me up a lot. And, and yeah, I went vegetarian like a couple years later. And I didn't know any vegetarians when I went vegetarian. I had never met a vegetarian in my life. And when I went vegan, I'd know, I knew a couple of vegans, but not many. So, What have you noticed different since becoming vegan? I was already a pretty healthy person, but I was healthy despite my diet, not because of my diet. You know, I was like the hardest thing for me to give up when I went vegan was cookies. I mean, I already talked about cookies. So I was honestly like, I think I would have been vegan in 1909, if not for the fact that you could get free cookies at the cafeteria. Like I, I was fairly poor in college, so I, I only had a one meal a day plan at the school cafeteria, and I would just eat as much food as I possibly could, and the food I loved more than any other food was chocolate chip cookies, and I still love chocolate chip cookies more than any other food in the world. You notice, I was, last time we were here at this restaurant, I ate like three chocolate chip cookies, which was awful, you shouldn't eat that many cookies. But one of the best things about being vegan, you know, unfortunately, it's no longer one of the best things about being vegan, but you'll understand why I say this, because, you know. But one of the best things about being vegan for me when I went vegan is I couldn't eat chocolate chip cookies anymore. And so I couldn't stuff my mouth and my face with chocolate chip cookies all day, because chocolate chip cookies back in 2001 and 1999 and 2000, they just weren't that available. You couldn't get vegan chocolate chip cookies everywhere, and now you can't. So it's no longer one of the best things about being vegan, because unfortunately, you go to... Frankly, even like normal grocery stores, and they often have vegan chocolate chip cookies. But back in 2000, wasn't the case. So it actually made me healthier because I was eating less junk food. And yeah, that's every year that's less true, unfortunately. <laughs> like, the junk food is more available even as a vegan. But for me, it made me healthier. I can't say it actually had made a huge difference to me in terms of my actual personal feelings, though, because I was already pretty healthy in terms of working out. I mean, I was a very fit person in the year 1999. I'm pretty fit today. So... But I think as you get older, the more it is the case, you have to eat healthy. So I think part of the reason I've been able to stay fit absolutely is I attribute it to the vegan diet in part. But I can't say it was part of my original motivation for being vegan or that it affected me much when I went vegan in 2001. What's the most important reason for you to be vegan now? So being vegan definitely has not helped me get dates. So that's not a good reason to go vegan because first of all, it didn't give me a date in 1999 and it still hasn't got me many dates. Um, no, I mean, seriously though, 100%, I, I, I don't fault anyone for having any other reasons. And I think those other reasons are legitimate and they can be very good reasons and 
righteous, you know, go at it. Like if you're vegan for health reasons, for environmental reasons, great. But the core of veganism to me is animal rights. It's because we care about the other living creatures of this earth. We believe they should not be harmed. And we believe in a world where no animal is harmed unnecessarily. And that's a beautiful vision. It's more important to me than anything in the world. More important, I'd like to think, than my own life, which is one of the reasons I've done some of the things that I've done that you know, have led me to, for example, be here in North Carolina, convicted of felony charges for the first time in my life, because that vision is worth it. You know, whatever price we have to pay to help these, these poor suffering creatures, given how much our species has benefited from human supremacy and violence against animals and exploitation of animals, it's about time for us to give a little back, and veganism is one way to do that. Why is it important for others to be vegan? People give a lot of really compelling reasons for that everyone should be vegan, including sustainability. It 100% is the case that animal agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to climate change. That methane from CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, and factory farms is many times more destructive greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So if you're concerned about fossil fuels, you should be concerned about factory farms too. People are concerned about public health, both antibiotic resistance from drugs that are being used in factory farms. And if you're eating meat in this country today, even stuff that's marketed as organic or humane or cage-free, oftentimes these companies are just outright lying to you. They're still using antibiotics and you're eating disease and drugs and all these terrible things for you and for the health of our entire species. But I think the most important reason all of us have a duty and obligation to be vegan is because animals are suffering. And you know, I, I, I really think that we have no more grounds for harming and killing and consuming non-human animals than we'd have grounds for harming and consuming and killing human animals, and, and in particular human children, because it's not just that we kill and torture so many billions of living creatures, it's that when you look at the individuals that are being slaughtered and you, you understand who they are and where they're coming from, it's almost always the most vulnerable and the youngest animals that are being tortured and killed in this way. So pigs are killed at six months, chickens are killed at six weeks, shockingly. Cows, it depends on the ranch and the CAFO and how long they raise them, but anywhere from six months to maybe two years. And um, each of these individual animals is just as sentient, just as conscious, and just as deserving of love and life as a dog or cat in our own homes. And I think the world will someday recognize that and, and see that it is our duty. And, and not just our duty, but it is, it's our honor. You know, it's, it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's, not just, it's not just a duty, it's something we should do with joy because the best part about us is our kindness. And that's one of the things I said at trial just a few weeks ago. Compassion is not the worst thing about us. It is not criminal. It is the best thing about us, and we should cherish it and honor it and see it as a duty that we perform with a lot of joy. How do you encourage others to be vegan? To me, the most effective way to convince someone to go vegan is to show that their tribe, whatever it is, is consistent with the vegan ethic, right? So if you talk to a Buddhist, talk about ahimsa, nonviolence, and compassion for all living beings. If you're talking to a Christian, you know, talk to them about the Christian Vegetarian Association and all the amazing Christian vegetarians out there. And the great thing is veganism is consistent with all the great spiritual and moral traditions, whether it's utilitarianism or Kantianism or rights-based thinking, whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Mormonism. I mean, there's actually some amazing passages from the Mormon I don't even know what it's called. I, the Book of Mormon, of course, um, about vegetarianism and our duty to have compassion for animals. But the number one thing you have to do is show this isn't about me imposing my values on you. This is about you finding your own values. This is about you recognizing that you don't want to hurt animals. And, and so that's always the right uh, general approach. But more specifically, I think we should talk to everybody about how the world is changing. People need to understand that this change is coming, and you know, they could be part of it or they could be left behind by history. And you don't have to put it in such abrupt and harsh terms, you know, don't tell someone, you're not vegan, you're a loser. But I mean, that is kind of the sense you want to convey to someone and do it in a positive way. And there's some really interesting research done by this guy, 
Greg Spark, who used to be at Stanford. I think he's at Princeton now. He was a graduate student in social psychology. And he's done research in what's called dynamic social norms. So telling someone that veganism is becoming the norm is a powerful way to convince them that they should go vegan. But even better than showing them that veganism is increasingly becoming the norm because we have the Impossible Burger, because all these celebrities are vegan, because you know, more and more people, even in places like rural North Carolina, are adopting veganism, is telling them that not only are a lot of people vegan, but the numbers are increasing, that there's acceleration in that paradigm. And that's when people see that the writing is on the wall. And again, do it in a constructive, humble way. Don't make it seem like they're losers and they're not part of it. Make it seem like they're already a part of this. And, and so I always start by asking people, what do you care about? Like, do you care about compassion for animals? Do you want to see animals being hurt? I'm guessing you don't. And when they say it, you know, latch onto that and say, that is awesome. Thank you so much. And whatever small gestures that person might have taken, maybe it's buying free range meat. You know, obviously you and I, most of us listening to this YouTube channel, are probably vegan, probably don't eat free range meat. And it's easy to start by saying, oh, don't you know that free range meat isn't actually humane? Don't you know that it's, it's all scam? And that's important information for them to hear, for sure. I'll say that more than anyone, because I've investigated free range farms. I've been inside of them. I've showed the world that free range often means you got a little you know, patio outside of a massive factory farm that can fit 10 chickens in a, in a shed that has 15,000 chickens in it, and the chickens never actually even go outside, and they're marking it as free range. So I, better than anyone, can tell you that is factually crap. It is nonsense. It's just factually false. But when someone tells me they eat free range eggs or free range meat, my starting point is not to tell them how stupid or wrong or ignorant they are. My starting point is to say, that is awesome. I bet you're doing that because you don't want to see animals in cages, and that's why you're a good person. And that's why you and I are on the same tribe. We are on the same team, because we agree that animals in cages is wrong. And then you go to educating them about why free range isn't what we think it is. But start out by saying to someone, your values are consistent with the vegan ethic. What you care about makes you a good person. And that's why I don't even have to convince you to be vegan. You're already basically there. You know, your behavior's not might be there quite yet. And frankly, neither am I. You know, like I, I could do more as an animal rights activist than what I'm doing now. I always aspire to be a better ally for the animals than I can be. So I'm not there yet either. And so neither is the person in front of me. But the fact that you care about animals, you care about animal suffering, means you are already part of the vegan movement. Yeah, everybody in the world is a proto-vegan in, in my view. Like, they might not be vegan yet. And again, I don't think you want to say that to someone because it's like, it's going to come across like saying, you know, you're like a Christian evangelist saying, oh, you might be Buddhist now, but I know in your heart you're already Christian. You know, they're not going to like that. So the terminology, and I, you know, honestly, like when I'm talking to non-vegans, I don't even really use the word vegan that much. I, I talk about violence against animals. I talk about you know, the ethic of compassion, like things they already understand and believe in. Because for a lot of people, veganism is, is alienating. It, it seems like, and part of that is because of the way veganism has been branded. It's been branded as this like weird dietary lifestyle. It's not an ethic, but this weird kind of diet. And, and so it's our job for people to understand the language they understand already and the values they already hold that they already believe in veganism. Even if they don't have the same association with the word, or the lifestyle that you and I have. What challenges have you had and how did you overcome those? My grandmother thought I'd gone insane. I mean, literally, like she tried to sneak beef broth into my soup. My grandmother had a lot of other strange beliefs. She also thought Chinese people had to eat rice. So she wasn't the most scientific person when it came to diet. But she was genuinely concerned about my health, partly because around the time I went vegetarian, I also started intermittent fasting and I lost like 40 or 50 pounds. And I was not fat like I was just buff because I was like a football player in high school and I got extremely thin so she thought I was like starving to death um, so that was an obstacle there's no vegan food around back when I went vegan so like you know it wasn't just cookies that weren't available but there was no Gardein there was no even Boca burgers weren't around so like my diet consisted of buying like tofu from Chinatown from packages and just like pouring soy sauce on pre-cooked and pre-prepared tofu and a can of lima beans. And I hated vegetables. So I, I went to vegetarianism and veganism coming from a place where my meal was like almost 100% meat. Like I was the sort of person who'd have dinner, which was like a stack of bologna and KFC. That was my entire meal. I, I didn't even like the mashed potatoes and gravy and mac and cheese. I just wanted the meat. 
So it was really hard for me in terms of just my diet. But even as hard as it was, like I think one of the things that people don't realize is all of us have the capacity to change. And we get in habits, we think we're stuck in those patterns permanently, but once you actually change those habits, you have the power to change. So it was really hard for me for like a month. And after that, I completely forgot about it. And you know, I haven't eaten meat in since 1999. I don't even remember what it tastes like. And to this day, like now when I eat things that are a little meaty tasting or what people say is, is meaty tasting, I just, I don't really remember what meat tastes like because it's been 20, 1999, what, 22 years? But honestly, stuff that people say is meaty tasting, I don't like it anymore. It's kind of shocking, you know, like Beyond Burgers, for example. I mean, I'm glad Beyond Burgers exist. Glad they're out there. They smell and taste kind of gross to me because I guess they do remind me of meat a little bit. And I don't like that flavor because I, I, it's just, they taste kind of and smell a little bloody, you know, and I don't like that association. But it's kind of surprising how much I've 180 on that. I guess it's not. When you've gone 22 years without eating meat, of course you're not going to like it. Um, so those obstacles can be overcome pretty easily. I think the activism obstacle was a lot harder for me than the, the dietary veganism obstacle. But that can be overcome too. But it took me longer and it was a lot harder road for me to become an activist. But here I am today as the co-founder of Direct Action Ever, advocating for everyone to be an activist. So we are stronger and braver than we think we are. And believing that is, is going to make it easier for you to make whatever change you want to make, whether it's veganism or getting involved in the movement. How might it be different if you were raised vegan? Absolutely. You know, I mean, one of the reasons I want to have kids, and I know it's controversial in the vegan community, there's a lot of human extinctionists, a lot of people concerned about human overpopulation. But one of the reasons I really want to someday raise a child and have a child is I think that it is hard to reverse all the programming you've received. And I would like to have children not just raise the vegan ethic, understanding that the animals of this earth are not food, they are our friends. Understanding on a deep psychological level that we live in a world of human supremacy and that the animals of this earth are our equals. Like when I read that first chapter of Animal Liberation at the age of 15, I remember thinking first, this is crazy. You know, you can't actually believe that we live in a tyranny of human over non-human animals. That's the first sentence of Peter Singer's book. The sentence is, this is a book about the tyranny of human over non-human animals. And again, even as an animal lover, even as someone who thought of myself as someone who really just believed that animals should be treated well, when I read that book and thought my species is a tyrant species, I thought, that can't be right. Are you saying, you know, I'm living in a period of atrocity and I'm on the top of that atrocity. And I think it's important for children to understand this and store, understand the historical and political importance of that, that atrocity and that system of oppression. And I'll just give you an, an example. Like, I think our dogs and cats should be raised as co-equal siblings. Like my dog is my child, you know? I love him more than anyone in the world. I love him more than my dad. I love him more than my sister. I love my dad and my sister. They're the dearest human beings on this planet to me. But I still love my dog more. And, and I would give more for my dog than for my dad. And, and I love you, dad. I mean, he's, he's an amazing human being. He's, he brought me to this earth. He's supported me so much over the years, even though I've been a huge headache as a child. But my dog is my child, you know, and they've given me everything. And they've been there with me through everything. And I'm going to raise kids in a way that they recognize not only is this dog your sibling, your brother, but they're a victim of oppression. At any point, a police officer could barge through this door and shoot your brother and face no consequences whatsoever. If we all died, your brother could be sent to a pound and killed for the crime of being unloved just because we couldn't find another home for him. Because my dog Oliver is a very nervous, terrified dog because he was rescued from a dog meat farm. He's terrified and scared of other human beings. He's not able to hurt a human being, but he will snap at them and bite them because he's terrified. And he can't even break skin, but it makes him a very unsuitable candidate. And, and so, if, God forbid, our family, for whatever reason, were to all die, Oliver could end up in a pound and kill. You know, that, that is a, a dark, violent reality my children need to understand. And they need to understand that it is our obligation as a family to fight for our family member who's in a press class. And oppressed, you know, I almost hate to use the term oppressed class because it's, it's become like social justice jargon and people conceive of oppression in all these kind of ways that sometimes trivialize 
you know, oppression that, that marginalized human beings and animals go through. By oppressed class, I mean there is a bullseye on one of our family members' heads, and at any point he could be killed just because of who he is and how he was born. And that's the dark side of it. The, the flip side of that, and I want to teach my kids this too, is because you are in a position of privilege as a human being, you have power that our family member does not, you can defend them. We have an obligation to defend this family member of ours, your brother. And that means we have, a, we have a, not just a right, but a duty to do so. And an immense power in changing the world so our family member doesn't have to suffer. And the last piece of that is, it's not just that you have the power to defend and change the world to make it a little safer for your brother, you know, your brother who's in a vulnerable place, but all these other animals, every chicken collapsed on the ground and infected your farm, every goat who's sick and not receiving veterinary care, they are just like your brother. And we have to fight for all of them in the same way we fight for our brother. Maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I believe that if you raise kids with this sort of philosophy, they will become powerful allies for animals, almost superhuman. And I, I, I think of myself as very limited. I think I'm like deeply affected by speciesism in ways that I do not understand. And I think if I were brought up in a way to truly appreciate both the depravity of human supremacy and the beauty of animal liberation, I could be a much stronger ally and give even more to the animals and, and just even the way interactive animals, interact with them in a way that transcends what I am able to do as someone who's brought up under a system of human supremacy, brought up accepting speciesism. So I just imagine raising children in a way that makes them, you know, just so much more powerful than I am in their deep appreciation for what animals can bring to this earth, who they are, and our power to change that, to change all the violence and cruelty and hatred that has been inflicted upon them over a period of hundreds of thousands of years. So yes, children can be raised differently. And I've seen it. I've seen even children, like I have a friend in Berkeley, and her name's Rachel, and her mom was an animal advocate. And she's never eaten animals in her life. And just the relationship she has with chickens in her family's home is just such a beautiful thing to see in a way that, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. Like I'm trying to progress and appreciate every animal the same way I appreciate like a human being or a dog. And I think it's for some species I am there. Like I, I really do think I love dogs. Like if there's a hierarchy of species, dogs are at the top of the list for me because my dogs are with me from day one and I, I owe my life to my dogs. Like I will do anything for my dogs. But appreciating a chicken the way I appreciate my dogs, I'm not quite there. And some people who were raised in a way to appreciate, embrace, and love these animals as equals, they are there. You know, and I, I aspire to be there the way they are someday. Any regrets? My entire life is regrets, my friend. I mean, I, what, what do I not regret? There's, I've made so many mistakes as an activist over the years that, like, if I started talking about the mistakes, it wouldn't just be one documentary. It, I mean, it would just be an infinite number of documentaries. Honestly, I think the biggest mistake I made, though, was just not understanding my power as an activist early on. Like, I thought it was enough to be vegan. And I thought that was all I could do. You know, I thought, you know, I'm not an activist. I'm, I'm, I'm an academic. I'm, I'm going to sit in an office and write about things and research things. And we have tremendous power. Like even being a vegan itself is tremendously powerful. And so be open about that. Like if you're not loud and proud about your veganism, you're doing it wrong. Sorry, but you are. Like, because there's tremendous power you have in setting the right example just from being vegan. But even beyond that, even beyond being open about your veganism and telling people why you're vegan, you know, and they always say like, how do you know someone's a vegan? Because they'll tell you about it. Great, that's good. And I'm not saying be a jerk about it. Like there's ways to do it in a way that's more productive and positive and constructive and humble. So learn those ways. But the way you learn those is by doing it. You know, don't, don't stop doing it just because you're messing up and you're saying things the wrong way and people are rubbing, getting rubbed the wrong way. But beyond veganism, understanding that, for example, we do have the power to just go right into a factory farm and save animals. I'm not saying you should do it because everybody has a different position in the movement. Not everyone should be taking the risk that I am. But understanding that we collectively have the power to just walk right into a factory farm in Slonos and walk off the animals. We have, we have the power to bring animal liberation to at least that one animal. That is a tremendous power that we have that we have to recognize in ourselves. So I think that's the biggest mistake. Not recognizing my own power and recognizing the power of this this movement has to change the world. I didn't become an advocate sooner because I was scared and I didn't think I could change people. I thought I was unpersuasive, 
I thought I was a shy guy, you know, it's kind of shocking for people to hear, but circa 1999, 2000, I, I really didn't have any friends. I was like, I never asked someone on a date. Even that one girl who was vegan at the University of Chicago, I never even told her I liked her. I don't think I even really talked to her. <laughs> I just liked her <laughs> quietly. And I was very scared of everything. And if I could go back to those days, I'd say, look, just go say things, speak your truth. And it's gonna come out clumsy initially probably, but that's okay, you'll learn. You'll, you'll get better with time and experience. The reason I didn't become vegan sooner, I mean, first, because I just didn't know any vegans or vegetarians. Like I didn't meet any vegans or vegetarians. It was so alien from my experience. And, and second, like a lot of people, I just thought I needed it. I thought, you know, I'm an athlete, I'm playing football. Like I don't know any vegetarians, but even if I did know vegetarians, I mean, I don't want to be like a weak, sniveling vegan or vegetarian who's like, you know, eating tofu and skinny. I actually did lose a lot of weight after I went vegetarian, but it had nothing to do with the vegetarians, but everything to do with the fact that I was like reducing my calorie consumption by like 40%. I'm 160 pounds now. Um, I can run a mile and sprint probably about as fast as I can. I could when I was 16 or 17 years old and I was on the track team and I was a sprinter and I was on the football team and I was one of the fastest people on the football team. Um, and I do attribute a lot of that to the fact, you know, that I've eaten better. Like if I continue to eat meat and cookies all day, as I did when I was 16, 17 years old, I'd be like a lot of my friends. I mean, people look at me today and they're kind of shocked I'm 40. And um, I am. And I attribute some of the fact that I'm 40 and I could still run like a, you know, close to five minute mile and I can still, I haven't tried benching 300 pounds. Wouldn't surprise me if I can. I can still do a crap ton of push-ups without even really doing much weightlifting. And I think a lot of that has to do with, I mean, obviously you gotta work out too, but a lot of it has to do with eating cleaner. And, and yeah, veganism is part of that because factory farms and, and meat in general, there's a lot of nasty shit in there that you should, no one should be putting in their body, even if they didn't care about animals. Prior to going vegan, did you ever think there's no way I could do that? Oh, of course, everybody, I, I, I mean, certainly anyone who grew up in central Indiana and farm country and conservative part of the country eating meat, uh, it was just so alien to my experience. When I met my first vegetarian, actually I should correct myself, I think I knew one vegetarian before I went to college. He was just such a weirdo and I was like, that's crazy. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I thought, I mean, how am I, I can barely get enough protein eating like a 100% meat diet. How am I gonna get enough protein eating a plant-based diet? But it was no problem at all. You know, it was absolutely no problem at all. There's so many, and especially today, I mean, back in 1999, it was a lot harder. You didn't have Boca Burgers and Guardian and Beyond. But even back then, you know, like once I learned how to make seitan, seitan is like such an amazing protein source and it's delicious. In fact, it's a healthier protein source because it doesn't have all the antibiotics and hormones and all the disgusting stuff you have in meat. It doesn't have any saturated fat, at least if you cook it the right way. And it's completely delicious. It's like nature's protein. Like no offense to all the anti-gluten people, but I'm very pro-gluten. I love seitan. And it's, it's just the most delicious protein in the world. And it's, it's an ancient protein that Buddhists and Chinese people have been meaning for I don't know how long, but at least hundreds, maybe thousands of years. So there's a time in your life where you think it's not possible, and then there's a time in your life when you learn to make seitan. <laughs> and once you learn to make seitan, you can make huge batches of it. It's really quick, it's really easy. It's incredibly cheap. Seitan is so cheap to make, and you quickly realize how stupid it was for you to think it would be difficult to be vegan. Do you worry about any specific nutrients? Not really. I mean, I drink supplemented soy milk and I, I take a vitamin D pill. But other than that, I don't, I, don't, I don't do anything other than vitamin D. I drink so much soy milk and like if you buy soy milk from Trader Joe's, you know, it's got like 50% of your daily value of B12. And I drink like a carton of soy milk a day. Sometimes more than that. Yeah, unsweetened. So. How do you suggest others get started? Veganism? I don't know, honestly. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm like an expert in like dietary stuff. I, I, I'd say just start with your heart. You know, it's just remember why you're doing it. And if you have the motivation, you'll find the way for yourself. What resources do you recommend? Well, I think everybody should read the first chapter of Animal Liberation, you know, and the preface of the first edition. The preface of Animal Liberation has gotten weaker and less interesting over the years because I think Peter Singer started out as like a radical philosopher in 1975 and he's He's moderated his positions to some degree since 1975, in my view. I mean, he's still a legend and you know, one of the greatest philosophers in history. But the preface of the first edition is very important to read. You should read those words. This is a book about the tyranny of human over non-human animals. But then you should read the first chapter of that book. All animals are equal, you know, because they are. And he just very logically and surgically breaks down the concept of speciesism 
and why human supremacy is a form of oppression, just like racism or sexism. And I think that's a foundation for so many folks. I will say that is the philosophical and intellectual foundation for it, but one of the reasons I didn't need to read the rest of Animal Liberation is I already knew about the cruelty animals were enduring, but some people will need to read the rest of Animal Liberation too and read about the horrible mutilation and confinement of animals in factory farms, the, the desperation and solitude of so many animals in laboratories. But it's a great book. I suggest you read it. Other resources I'd suggest are finding a local vegan community, you know? The 10 words of advice I give everybody who's interested in animal rights are, you know, find your voice, find some friends, and fight like hell. Find your voice just means believe in your truth, speak that truth. You know, if you don't believe in it, no one else will. And, and frankly, you won't even be able to stay true to your belief system unless you're willing to speak it. So find your voice and speak it. Because until you've spoken it, you don't actually believe it. Find some friends. You know, it's so important that we get social support. We are a social species. Be around people, believe some of the things you believe. I'm not saying isolate yourself from others because obviously you've got to change the world if you're vegan, if, if you're vegan for the right reasons at least. But find that support network and then fight like hell. And when I say fight, I mean two things, right? One is, you know, a fight is, is something where there's an adversary and understand that if you're in any sort of fight, like if you've been in a physical fight and I've unfortunately been in some fist fights, if you just kind of keep doing the same thing over and over again, like if you weren't a fighter, right? And you just keep doing this you're not going to succeed. I mean, the person just has to move to the left or the right and then punch you from there. And I'm saying this metaphorically. Obviously, I believe in nonviolence. None of us should be physically fighting anyone, even if they're fighting you. I, I really do believe this. I think if someone's harming you, you shouldn't fight back. You should not harm anyone. Um, but I did get in fights, and I told you I was a football player, and I got in fist fights too. And just metaphorically, understanding that any sort of fight is a dynamic system, meaning strategy has to be dynamic. You cannot keep doing the same thing meaning everything you do has to be adaptive, you have to be creative, you have to understand the mentality of your adversaries and adjust your strategy to that mentality. It's a dynamic game. Second thing about a fight though is anyone who's been in a fight will tell you is it hurts, right? It's not just that you have to adjust and be creative, but you're gonna get slugged. And if you go into the animal rights movement thinking it's all gonna be hunky-dory, it's all gonna be super easy, there's not gonna be any pain, you don't understand what a struggle is, what a social movement is. And social movements require sacrifice. I'm not saying everyone has to sacrifice the same way. You know, not everyone has to go to prison, not everyone has to be physically harmed, but understanding that everyone has to sacrifice in some way. And here's the good thing. Just like any other sacrifice, like if you're trying to physically make yourself stronger, if you go into a workout, or if you go into like martial arts training, believing that it's gonna be hunky-dory and very easy, then the mo for a moment you face some sort of pain, you're gonna back out and drop out. But if you go into activism or veganism, understanding there are going to be times where this is going to be hard, and that is okay. In fact, that is part of the growing process. Then when you hit that struggle, when you feel that pain, you'll realize, I'm just going to grow from this. It's not going to stop me because I went into this already knowing there's going to be some pain. So that's what I mean when I say, and fight like hell. Go into it knowing that you have to be creative, you have to be adaptive, work with your friends, get the social support you need so the fight isn't as hard as it might otherwise be. Understand that you have to use the creativity and, 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 and the intelligence of a group of people to adapt to the challenges you face. But also when you hit that obstacle, whether it's somebody making fun of you at work, one of your family members disowning you. I mean, that kind of happened to me at some points. Like that pain is something you have to anticipate and get ready for even before you get started as an activist. And then when you anticipate it and understand that's gonna be part of the game, then when you deal with it, it's gonna be a lot easier. And for me, that includes prison time. Why do you think some people quit veganism? Number one reason is lack of social support. And the way you avoid it is find some friends. Go up on meetup.com, Facebook, whatever. And I don't mean adding people on Facebook who are vegan when I say friends. That's, that's not, I mean, I've got a lot of wonderful relationships with people through social media. And honestly, I, I do consider some people I know primarily through social media friends, but the people I know on social media who are my friends are people I've Zoomed with at least, you know, and it's, it's not the same. So the number one reason people give it up is because they don't have social support. Go find that social support, at least through Zoom and video conference, like have a video call with someone who's vegan. But the best thing is come out physically in person to a vegan restaurant. Meet the owners of the restaurant. Start a vegan meetup yourself. There are vegans everywhere. So if you don't have vegans around you, form a vegan meetup yourself and connect yourself with other vegans because that's the thing that's going to give you support over the long term. 
Do you have a success story you'd like to share? My dad is not entirely vegan. He's been vegan-ish at times. He's probably most, my most important success story. And, he, you know, he kind of backslid a lot when my mom passed away, which happens to a lot of people. Because when you've had a habit for decades, even if it's a bad habit, whether it's alcohol, whatever, and you go through some sort of personal crisis, sometimes like that causes you to backslide a little bit. But I'm still really proud of him because he's one of the biggest animal rights supporters I know. He contributes more financially to the animal rights movement probably than any human being I know. I want to say how much exactly because that's his private information, but this is somebody who slaughtered animals with his own hands, um, both as a vivisector and as someone, my understanding is they killed chickens when he was growing up, but he was a vivisector who profited off of animal exploitation for decades uh, and now he believes in the cause. He thinks it's righteous. And I mean, first and foremost, it's because he's a good person. But second, it's because he was open to listening to his son. That's amazing. So I love you, Dad. You're, you're an awesome person. Do you ever think you'll need to eat animals or their secretions again? I think it's more likely that I would eat my own thumb than ever eat an animal again. I'll put it that way. And I have no interest in eating my own thumb, in case any of you are curious does not look very tasty. It's a very ugly thumb, does not look very delicious. If you weren't an activist, what would you be doing instead? You know, it's, it's funny, because I, I found an immense joy in activism, but not because activism to me is intrinsically interesting. There are a lot of interesting problems, but there's a lot of aspects of activism. Like, I'll tell you, the thing that's not intrinsically interesting about activism is I don't like making people unhappy. And I think activists do, on some level, we have to challenge things. We have to push boundaries. And I'm not saying you do that in a mean way. And there's enormous joy in activism. But I'm, not, I'm a people pleaser. I like people to be happy. I don't want people to be upset. And I've upset people to the point that they want to put me in prison. You know, that's not a great place for me as someone who's a people pleaser. But there's still nothing more important or beautiful that I could do with my life. But if I could do other things, I mean, I tried to be an academic at one point in my life. I'd still love to try and be an academic. But honestly, there's just like a billion things I'd love to. I'm such a curious person. I mean, Every day there's something new. I think, oh, it would be really cool to do that. It'd be really cool to learn a lot about cameras and become a videographer, photographer like you. It'd be really cool to, you know, learn how to make a TV and be an engineer. It'd be really cool to learn an enormous amount about Roman history and become like a history of the Roman Empire. I mean, there's so many things that I would love to do with my life. And if my life were just about joy and pleasure, I'd probably do those things. But, you know, the greatest joy we can, we can come to as human beings as moral animals, and I think we are deeply moral animals at a fundamental level, and I think we're deeply good animals, is making the world a kinder place, especially for those who need it. Got a favorite quote you want to share? My favorite quote of all time, and I'm going to butcher it, is the, the last sentence of the first chapter of The Brothers Karamazov, a novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And actually, I could probably read it to you if I have my phone. Yeah. I'm going to pull it up. My favorite quote of all time is the last sentence from the first chapter of what I think is the greatest book in history. And it's a book by Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist. Um, and the quote is this. And I'll explain why it's so important in a second. And it's also an animal rights quote. And maybe no one in the history of Dostoevsky fandom has thought this is an animal rights quote, but I'll explain why it's an animal rights quote after I read it. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose. And we ourselves are too. I'm going to say that again. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose. And we ourselves are too. When I read this, I was in a very dark place in my life. And I was very ashamed of myself and also very hateful towards other human beings. And this quote, I won't say, I mean, I don't think any one sentence really can transform your life. But this, this quote shook me in a very, very deep way. This quote didn't alone change me, but the mentality that this quote represents transformed me completely. From being someone who hated everyone else and hated myself, to being someone who, I, I do love myself, and I love all human beings too, even the human beings who are harming me. You know, which is one of the reasons I just, I had a wonderful coffee with the prosecutor just literally a few minutes ago, who was trying to to convict me of multiple felonies, because I love him. I think he's a good guy, and I believe in him deeply. And the reason this quote reflects that is, this is the quote that established for me, and I, I, and I thought this the moment I read this, that human beings are just animals. Like, we think we're so smart. We think we're so clever. We think we're so malicious and evil and strategic and maniacal and sadistic and narcissistic and all these negative things and positive things. Like, we think... But at, at root, we are just animals with very simple hearts, with very simple desires. And the root of so much fear and insecurity and violence is just 
the denial of our very basic animal nature, that we need safety, we need companionship, we need love, and we lack those things, it manifests itself in all these very negative, destructive ways. Destructive for ourselves, too. I wrote this in this blog, you know, this is, I read this from a blog I wrote when my dog died a few weeks ago. It's a blog called Lessons on Love from a Killer. You should all read it, because Lisa deserves to be remembered, and she was just a beautiful, vibrant, living creature who just showed me so much of what love and beauty are. I say this in the blog, but a lot of people think the problem the animal rights movement is facing is, is we think the animals are beneath us, you know, that we look at animals and say they're beneath us. And, and that's, that's a problem. I'm not saying that's not a problem. And, and, and that is one aspect of human supremacy that needs to be addressed. Because, you know, like a dog can smell literally millions of times better than a human being. A bat can literally see with her ears. That's an amazing thing that a bat can do, right? I mean, so it is not the case that we are better than them, that we have attributes that exceed the other animals of this earth. But I don't actually think that's the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is not that we see them as beneath us, it's that we see ourselves as above them, that we think when we look at an animal and we look at ourselves, we think we're different than them and we have different attributes. And actually what we are is such simple creatures, right? So instead of seeing them as beneath us, we should see us ourselves as, as where they are. Like, and that's, that's a, a small and nuanced difference in perception, right? But it's an important one. And once we start re realizing that we are just simple animals for all the sophistication and cleverness and intelligence we think we have, at root, we're just like silly animals running around. And I understood that about dogs almost instinctively. Like I've dealt with so many aggressive dogs dogs that have behavioral problems, that don't listen to commands, that pee everywhere, that poop everywhere, that bite dogs, that bite human beings. And I've, with some small exceptions, and I blog about this in this blog, I've never faulted a dog for the mistakes they've made. I understand my lack of understanding. And I understand that this dog is at root, whatever the manifestations of her bad behavior, is a good and decent living creature. And we need to extend that same goodwill to other human beings too. And once we understand that, then we become more powerful. It's interesting that we think we're more powerful based on our cleverness. We're actually more powerful and more profound beings when we understand our weakness and our vulnerability and our simplicity. You know? And so I think that's so important. I think this quote captures all of that. I'll say it again. As a general rule, as a general rule people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose. And we ourselves are too. We have to embrace our simple hearts. And when we do that, it's not a sign of our weakness. It's a sign of our power. So thank you, Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share? The movement's gonna win. Like, I have no doubt about that in my mind. Like, I think, and I think it's gonna be faster than anyone thinks. So, you know, I, I've said when DXE started, one of the things that, that drew people to DXE was the fact that when we started this, I said, we are going to achieve animal liberation in one generation. There will be a species equality act, a animal bill of rights, a constitutional amendment that gives animals the right to be safe, happy, and free within one generation. And I think, if anything, it's going to be faster than that. And some of the predictions I made, people thought were absurd, and they've actually come true. So, for example, when we started doing fur advocacy, I said, I think we're going to be able to pass this in Berkeley in the next few years. And we passed it in 2017. And then I said, we'll do it in San Francisco. And we did it in San Francisco in 2018. And then it happened in California in 2019. And even I didn't predict that. I said, it's going to be like five years before we can cover the entire state. And it happened in one year. You know, so, like, things are changing very, very fast. Um, and I, when we started DXC, I was the most optimistic person I knew, and it's changing faster than I expected. So the one thing we haven't addressed is just the fact that this isn't just a pipe dream. This is a reality that's unfolding. And again, get on the bandwagon or go home, because you're going to be left behind by history. That's not the most important reason to be an animal rights activist, but it's a good one. And the point about the simple heart is this. A lot of people think we're trying to lift animals up to where human beings are. And I think sometimes what we should be doing is bringing humans down to where animals are. And understanding down where they are is a beautiful place. You know, and all the contrivance and money and stress and professionalism and intelligence and strategy and manipulation that is the human condition, that's not actually where we thrive. And that's not who we are. You know, at root, we're animals. And 
to the extent we can get away from all the contrivance of human society and get back to who we are at root, like bring ourselves down to animals, it's a good thing for all of us. For the animals, for sure, because we'll stop hurting them and trying to subject them to all this exploitation because we think, well, don't you realize that eating animals is what made us smart? Or don't you realize to feed 7 billion people on this planet, we need to have factory farms? Let's just bring ourselves down to where they are and understand we're all equal and in our simple hearts. But he asked the question about prison versus probation. I don't know if I should say the name of my friend because my good friend who shared this with me is in a different place in life and he's in a position where he doesn't necessarily talk about his, his history as a leftist activist and his history in prison. Like I've got a good friend, he's a very distinguished person and doing very distinguished things who has a, a history of incarceration as an activist for the Catholic left. And one of the things the Catholic left is, believes in is part of your ministry of service, if you really want to fight for the vulnerable, you have to be vulnerable yourself. If you want to fight for those who have no power, you have to be powerless yourself. So one of the rites of passage is to go to prison. You do civil disobedience, you do the time, and you understand from saying things from the perspective of someone at the bottom, how the world actually operates. And I think the same is true of animal rights. I think there are insights I probably just cannot develop unless I've lived life in a cage. And I've been in jail many times, but it's always been short stays, and I don't know what it feels like to be in a cage and think, it's gonna be a while before I get out. So I don't want to have that experience on a personal level. I think it's gonna be a very unpleasant experience. But it kind of relates back to what I said about this being a fight. Not a physical fight in the sense that we're trying to hurt someone, but a fight in the sense that we are going to have to experience some pain and everyone's gonna to have to experience some pain in different ways. And I know, or I think I know, that one form of pain that will make me stronger and that I'm able to bear is the pain of losing my own freedom. So someday I expect to experience that. And it could come sooner rather than later because I've now got two felonies on my record and three more felony cases to come and each felony, you know, is gonna make the sentencing calculation a lot more severe. Between the time you were convicted and sentenced, did you feel any kind of desperation with the uncertainty? My heart was definitely beating when the jury verdict came in. Honestly, I don't feel that I felt that desperate after the sentence came in. And my main reason for not feeling desperate, but certainly excited and feeling a sense of anticipation before the jury verdict came in was because I said before that regardless of what the jury decided, I think this is a win and I do think it's a win. And you know, we've been in The Guardian, I was just interviewed by Democracy Now! this morning. Probably at least hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people will hear about animal rights because of this trial. But at the end of the day, you know, a win is what we're going for. We want a jury, even in rural North Carolina, even in a place in this country where they've historically raised and killed animals for food and for other purposes, uh, the people agree that animals are living creatures and not things. And compassion is not a crime. It's every human being's right. So the anticipation of thinking it was possible, I thought it was unlikely. You know, if you ask anyone I talked to before, and I went into this trial, 100% convinced I was gonna be convicted, not 100%, but I think the percentage odds I put it at was 80%. Like I told John, my reading so far in the trials, I'm gonna get convicted. This is, this is gonna lead to conviction. <laughs> uh, and my prediction proved true. But I still thought there was a chance of a hung jury, like maybe one juror who's gonna make a decision of conscience, even, even with how little information the jury received. Um, but the sentence itself, no. I mean, I think I, I was ready for it. And I think I am ready for it when it comes. And I think, honestly, it's, it's probably a question of when and not if, because with, I don't know how many felonies I have left to deal with, it's probably a dozen, maybe? I don't, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's, it's kind of a little embarrassing that I don't even know how many felonies I'm currently being charged with, but there's too many for me to count. Or not too many for me to count. Too many for me to remember at this point while I'm trying to recount how many felonies I have, because there's a lot. You know, I think the good thing is I don't feel like I have to hide my vulnerability and weakness. And I don't even think it's a weakness. It, it, it relates back to what I said about the simple heart, that 
the pain I'm going to feel from being separated from my cat, it's a weakness in the sense that it causes me pain. And it scares me, you know, it does scare me. Like that, that is, and I said that when we were in the Airbnb. I mean, when I almost broke down, it was because I've got a 15 year old cat. He's, you know, he along with his brother, my best friends, his brother's a dog, but I call them brothers. Cause they are, they love each other. And I've got, if you see the, um, the screensaver, the, the background image on my computer, it's my little cat, Joan. His name's Joan, but he's a boy cause he doesn't believe in gender names. And also because I didn't realize he was a boy when I adopted him, I thought he was a girl cause he was a kitten. And, when you're inexperienced with cats, it's hard to sex cats, so I thought he was a boy, or a girl, so I named him Joan. And my other little boy, Oliver, who's a dog, but they're best friends, and I have an image of Joan sleeping with Oliver, and he's literally cuddling. He's sleeping on Oliver's chest. It's just absolutely adorable. Being separated from them will cause me pain, but that same feeling of attachment and love for them also gives me enormous strength, because part of the reason I'm able to fight so hard for animals is because I know that the animal being slaughtered in a factory farm is just like Joan and just like Oliver. And that feeling of pain, I, I, I feel even from separation from Oliver, knowing that Oliver will experience a little bit less joy and Joan will experience a little bit less joy because they won't have their dad in their life. As much as that hurts me to imagine Oliver being beaten to death and eaten, which is what his fate was going to be before he rescued him. It's just, it's almost unimaginable. I mean, I, I can't imagine it. Like my brain breaks when I think about that. So this attachment I have to them is a source of strength, even as it's a source of vulnerability. So, and honestly, I think that's something I've worked on over the years. I think that being able to express it openly. I mean, Chinese people are known for always putting up a brave face. Like we have this phrase in Chinese, mei mianzi, mei mianzi, which is when you show your emotions, it's shameful. It's like, it literally means you have no face. And what it means, that's what it literally means. What it means in actuality is you should be putting up a face. And if you don't put up your face, that's embarrassing and shameful. And I think we have to break that down. And I think part of the reason I think I do feel good about myself and my future, no matter what happens, is because I've gotten better about taking down that fake face and trying to just be as real as I can. So, yeah, I've cried many times in front of people and, you know, if I'm feeling it, you can expect to see me cry because I will cry again. Tell us more about your rescues. I am probably most known in the animal rights movement for founding Direct Action Everywhere, but specifically for founding the Open Rescue Network, which is a network of activists who go into places where animals are being tortured and killed, document what's happening inside, taking an animal out, regardless of what the owner or the government tell us we're allowed to do or not allowed to do, because we believe we have a deep and profound and fundamental moral right and legal right to rescue these animals. And then stating that openly to the world, you know, showing our face and saying, this is why we did what we did and this is what we did. If you'd like to punish us, please come and punish us. And it's one of the reasons I'm facing so many felonies because I've openly rescued, I don't know how many dozens of animals. It's probably over a hundred, maybe even hundreds of animals over the years. I've written before, and I believe this, that rescue is the defining action of the animal rights movement because it is the embodiment of animal liberation. This is literally what we want to happen to every suffering animal on this planet. And uh, the spirit of nonviolence, nonviolence is about being the change we want to see in the world. But most people don't understand what Gandhi meant by that. He didn't mean just like, you know, be a nice person and don't be racist, don't be a colonialist, don't kill people. He meant literally go change the world. Like go and place yourself in between the victim of the oppressor and stop the oppression, to stop the violence from happening with your own physical body if necessary. That is what he meant by be the change you want to see in the world. And to me, rescue, even in the face of tremendous obstacles, is the defining action of the animal rights movement, the defining action of, in particular, nonviolence in the animal rights movement. But the most notable rescue is 100%, you know, the rescue of my two kids. Like, I openly rescued my cat from the pound when he was going to die because he had ringworm and he was one of many cats that was going to be killed because the pound just felt like the cats of ringworm were too much of a liability and I just took them from the shelter, just like stole them essentially. And then 13 years later, I rescued Oliver from a dog meat farm in China because he was days or weeks from being clubbed to death and killed. And yeah, every day I wake up and I look at Oliver and I, it reminds me that miracles are possible because 
out of all the millions of dogs that are killed in China for flesh in just awful, brutal, terrifying ways, all the dogs in China who've never known a kind human touch, never been outside and, and seen the sky with their own eyes, never been free. You know, this little guy got out and all the other dogs that are sitting there with no hope, Oliver's proof there's hope for everybody and none of them should ever give up. Because you never know when you're going to be that one in the million that some random dude shows up at your doorstep, at the doorstep of that farm that day and decides I'm taking you out. And that's the life he gave. And we can give that life to every animal. And that's what we're going to do. How does saving an animal make an impact? Well, you rescue one and you rescue them all. There's an old cliche, but it's true, that to save life is to save the world. And because the symbolic power of that one single life saved inspires others to do the same. And that's what we've done with Hope and Rescue. Do you get desensitized from witnessing all this cruelty? I, I don't look at photos or videos of animal cruelty. I mean, I, I couldn't watch all of Dominion. I've seen Earthlings, I think, once, and I tried to watch it again. I can't get through the first act. Like, the scene where there's a dog in a dump truck, I think, is where I always end, because I break down in tears and I turn it off and I don't watch anymore. Um, and it's interesting, because I've seen more real-life cruelty, I think almost certainly more than anyone I know. <laughs> um, and other than people actually work in these slaughterhouse and factory farms, you know, probably more than anyone on this planet. Like, those people see more because they see it every day, but they're also completely desensitized to it because they do see it every day. But I've seen a lot of it. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon when you're actually doing an open rescue mission because your adrenaline's running, because you know there's so much danger. And it, it's kind of like how people in the military say, like, even when I've been shot or when there's people dying around me, I don't necessarily feel it. Because it, when adrenaline kicks in, you just, you become desensitized to everything because you just have a mission. And it's afterwards when you realize what you saw that it starts to get to you. Um, but in my daily life, I just don't watch images of animal cruelty at all. And that's good, I think. Think about Oliver. I mean, he lived in a concrete pen and probably never stepped outside. He was furless because mange was eating away his skin and his fur. He had parasites of all sorts in his belly, so he was not able to properly digest food. He was the weakest in the pen he was in, so he lived every day of his life fighting for food and terrified. To this day, he has massive food insecurity when he sees food. When I bring food out to him, he runs away because he's afraid someone's going to attack me if I try to eat. This is, this is his life, living in fear every single waking moment and thinking, even when I eat, when I fulfill this very basic biological function, my response is even more terror and fear. It's gotten a lot better. I won't even say he's gotten a lot better. His entire life has been transformed. And, you know, he, he never played. Like, he, he didn't have a ball. And there's this video I watch every time I'm feeling kind of down or pessimistic. It's a video of Oliver dancing. Like, he, um, maybe you can show this in the video because it's just such an adorable video. And this is a dog that never had any joy in his life. And within a couple weeks, when I brought him back to Berkeley, California, you could still see in the video that he's kind of hairless because he had mange. And, but he plays one of the, he picks up one of these squeaky tennis balls for the first time in his life. And he's, he's so happy, he literally spins around and dances. Like he's hopping up and down and he's dancing. He's so happy. So this dog went from a world where every moment of his life was fear to now, I won't say every moment because he still has moments of fear and trauma but most of the moments of his life are love and joy. And that's a transformation that every animal on this earth deserves. And we can give it to them. And when you see that transformation, you understand why we have to transform the world, because it's impossible. I, even a psychopath or a sociopath, you cannot see an image of Oliver when we rescued him. And, and an image or a video of Oliver just a few weeks later in Berkeley, California, dancing in my bedroom with a tennis ball, and not say, this is the where the world should be. And it's where the world's going. Do you think we'll ever have a vegan world? I, I don't think it. I know it. It's, it's coming. I mean, I already said that. It's just, I honestly think it's a little silly when people think not. I mean, it's, and there are very good statistical reasons for this. You look at polling data, it's going the right direction. You know, if you just do a straight line trajectory from 2005 to 2050, you know, like well over a majority of Americans will believe that animals should have the same rights as human beings by the year 2040 or 2050. If you look at kind of polling data on how many people think slaughterhouses should be banned, one in two Americans to this, on this very day believe that slaughterhouses should be banned. Do most of those Americans eat animals? Yes, but they're very deeply uncomfortable with the act of slaughtering animals. 
And that's why even in rural North Carolina, even in a conservative area of the country, and I'm not afraid to say that I think slaughtering animals should be a crime. Because I mean, rural North Carolina, there's going to be a much smaller percentage than Berkeley, California, probably. But overall, across the entire country, one in two Americans believe that slaughterhouses should be banned. That is a fertile ground for the animal rights movement to build. So I don't think it. I know it. It's happening.